Three, two, ah, oh, better. Can you give me a cookie, please? Ya puedo irme a una calle y tú y paso. El que está más suavecito. Right. Three, two. Welcome back to the Sandbar. And joining us on today's episode with your friendly neighborhood MC, Sandy Paulino, is Pastor Sandy Paulino. Yes, this is my dad. He's finally joining us here at the Sandbar. Bobby, how are you doing? I'm doing great, doing great. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here with you uh, and be part of this uh, exciting new adventure where you are taking on and very proud of what you've done and your accomplishment. Really, thank really you. proud. Thank you, thank you. You're doing a great job, by the way. I just Thank want you. to tell you that. Um, and there's there's uh, my dad gassing me up. But uh, so my dad is here to touch on uh, kind of relationships. He's going to talk about marriage and we're also going to talk about family relationships, too. So I thought it was, you know, I thought it would be better to have my own family members come on here. And uh, we couldn't have everybody in, but we're going to keep this is going to be a topic of conversation that we're going to keep touching on. So, Papi, um, what is, you know, what's your, your background? What, what do you know about marriage and family counseling and that kind of relational stuff? Uh, well, first of all, I've been married for, happily married for 28 years uh, with my lovely White House. Congratulations. Your mother, uh, by the way. Uh, and uh, we've been married for 28 years. We've been dating for almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years now s since uh, July 28th. will be 30 years of uh, uh, between uh, dating and marriage. And it's been wonderful. It's, it's a roller coaster, but uh, it's, it has been uh, a great experience. Uh, I also uh, went to school at uh, Evangelical Seminar for family and in, in, in uh, marriage counseling or marriage therapy. Uh, this one courses over there, and also as a pastor, I have had uh, different trainings and conferences, and several conferences that have helped me uh, equip myself to be a better person and be an assistant to other people. Okay, okay. So, do you think that training and those classes that you took helped you in your own marriage, not just in other people's, like giving other people counseling? Oh, definitely, definitely. It's something that um, I have been able to apply to, to my own life, to my own family. But more of it, because of my experience and taking those training, um, it gives me more of a more confidence and stronger tools uh, to help other people. But the first person that I have to help is myself. Mm. That's a good. That's a good way to approach it. So I guess 28 years, that's like... I think the big question here is how do you how do you get to that many years? You know, how do you get past the first five, the first 10, the first 20 years of sharing your life with a whole nother person? Well, that's that's a topic of 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 a long conversation. However, uh, to me, it's very simple. It is one of those things that um, if you're able to communicate and understand that marriage is not just. Uh, sharing your life with another person, but that it is a compromise that you do with someone else to uh, to share your life with. A lot of time when, when you know, especially in our culture, when you get married, it's like the woman is the one that gets married. The female is the one that gets married, not the male. Uh, but uh, through our times and, and studying and, and looking at the difference and also the description that um, God gives to the Bi uh, in the Bible to what marriage is and how important it is. Um, I understood that marriage is just more than signing a piece of paper, and it is more uh, than just having someone with you. It is uh, a compromise that you take on uh, uh, with somebody else to embark on a journey um, that you don't know where it's going to end, and that only you can put an end to it so um when you when it comes to a relationship one of the problems that we see today is that um people don't like to talk people don't like to communicate yeah and and also um the culture has played a big role 
in society. And uh, one of the things is that we have gone astray from uh, what the family is, what, what is a family. Uh, what's the difference between a house and a home? Because there's a big difference. Uh, so we could get into those topics and, and, and discuss some of those, some of those things because uh, it is important today that we get educated in what marriage really is. Mm. Okay. So I guess because there's a lot, this isn't going to be, like we're not going to be able to cover everything that has to do with marriage and relationships. But I guess for you, what has been, with Mommy, what has been kind of like the foundational piece to that you guys, if everything is falling apart, like if you guys are just not agreeing on something or, when you in the beginning of your relationship when you were questioning each other what was the thing that kind of kept you together what was that that last what was that foundation that you guys could always lean on um love love and respect uh i think that was the main thing uh because when you have love for somebody whether you agreed or not it becomes a point where you agree to disagree and move on to the next topic uh so uh, I think being sincere in in your relationship with with somebody or with one another um, is is the greatest foundation that you could um, lay in order to build. So it's like a, a so it's like an honest love because you know there's relationships where you love people, but it's kind of that the you kind of love them and however you want to love them mm -hmm. and they love you however they want to love you. But it, it does it clashes a lot or there's a lot of problematic things going on that never get resolved. So the, just to make sure I'm understanding. It's like a, a love that you communicate how you're feeling, but in also you're understanding how the other person is feeling. So you exactly. don't like you're you're coming from a selfless type of love. Exactly. The thing with with love is that people have defined love, in my own opinion, the wrong way. Why? Because love it's not a sentiment. It's an action. It's a decision. So mm. you decide that you're going to love somebody or not. Yeah. You do, you decide how you're going to love that person. And if, if, and this, this different type of love, you no, know, the love I have for you is, is something that was born because you were basically born of me. I mean, I saw you the day that, that you were born and I always remember that, that day and, 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 uh, the, the day that you were born, that, that love was born with you right then and there. But with your mom, uh, it, I don't believe in that thing of love at first sight. But it was a once I notice and I figure out the type of woman that she was, the type of girl that she was. I said to myself, this is someone that you could build a family with. So, uh, so when you see those characteristics... In, in a person, and, and you see their their temper, you see you know, uh, their character and, and how they behave, then it comes the second part, part where you say, this is the person I'm going to love. And no matter what, you know, I'm going to communicate to her you know, the way I feel and um, what I do and don't like because I see myself growing old with this person. The problem is that today we don't communicate uh, with one another, and that's a problem. So there's that kind of cliche where everyone's like, oh, we're, we're, we don't communicate, or we're not communicating, or I feel like we could communicate better. I think we need to specify that a little bit, porque you, you, give, you say that to somebody that maybe you're not communicating enough, or they come to you and say that we're not communicating, but we have to kind of get past that initial general problem and understand kind of like what you said was very specific mm -hmm. about how you feel in certain situations and how you want to approach being with this person and saying that in words and when people are like oh i feel like we're not communicating it's more they're not telling each other when they're upset or they're not telling each other when little things bother them you know we we need to kind of get into that space when we're talking about communication uh, exactly, and 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 the biggest problem is that uh, we try to talk to one another and through one another without us knowing our own position. You no know, communication is a two-way street. 
meaning uh, you give, but you also have to receive. And if you expect somebody to understand and to uh, be uh, in agreement with you on something that you're saying or something that, that you're communicating, you need to be able to accept the other individual, the other person's uh, um, opinion so that they can be also part of the conversation. Yeah. Because if you just talk your way into a situation and you're expressing yourself, however, you don't take into account the other person's uh, feeling or their stand on uh, their position in something. So it's very different because then it becomes a talk, not a conversation. Uh, so it's like that listen to understand instead of listening to respond. A lot of, I think that's been understood a little bit more over the years where even for me, it's difficult when you're, especially when you're in an emotional state. Cuando te están hablando, it's like when when somebody's trying to communicate something to you, even if it's even if it's coming from their own emotions, you you internalize it, waiting to hear what you want to hear so that you can respond mm -hmm. instead of trying to understand how they're feeling and why they're saying what they're saying and figuring out where this is coming from, and then after that, you can give a much better response. But exactly. When we get in, like, I mean, I have this this problem with Alexa sometimes, where we're arguing back and forth. Who's Alexa? My sister, <laughs> <laughs> your daughter. When we're arguing back and forth, we we like we get into this moments as because I I try to be a better debater so we can have a productive conversation. But there are moments where she talks and then I'm just waiting for her to finish so that I can say my point or so that I can to pick out a piece of what she said and and respond to that instead of taking the whole thing breaking apart what she's saying, why she's saying, saying it, and then responding to that so that we can move forward. And, you know, she does that too. Uh, <laughs> one of the problems that we have is that we are not active listeners. Uh, we are passive listeners. We listen to, the, like you, you were saying, to that the word that cues your response. And and that's not communication. That's that's an argument or, or, or a talk. Um, but a communication is is understanding is me understanding your position and trying to to get to a middle ground and you understanding my point and working with me uh, or working together to to come to an agreement uh, in a communication not always you you're gonna agree 100 uh, percent and but uh, like your mom and I we have had discussion or agree or or, or we have had moments where, we don't agree on a point or a topic, but that's the end. We decided that that was the end, and did it resolve the problem? No, uh, or at least the situation at that point, but the problem was solved. She made her point, I made mine. Uh, she disagreed with my point, I disagreed with her point, but that is it. No, we don't bring up the point again because we understood that in her view, she was right. In my mind, I'm I'm right, but it's not something that's gonna affect our marriage, our home. You no, know, like I said, you know, it, there's people that live in a house. There's family that live in a house, and then there are family that built a home in a house. Two different things. A house is 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 a place to you know where you can find refuge. A home. It's a safe uh, environment that you created. It's a habitat that you created uh, for your family's well-being. Uh, it takes it takes a family. It takes uh, to build a home, but it takes a marriage, man and a woman, to build a family. So you cannot build a home without a family. You cannot build a family without marriage. That's okay. my belief. Okay. So, because... I guess just to, to would you define the marriage as the two heads of the household, the two the couple that is the head of the family and then whoever they're taking care of, like their kids, grandkids, stepkids, adopted kids, you know, nieces and nephews, whoever they're taking care of, if they're the legal guardian of some other kids then that family is being held together by that head of the family, by that couple that holds it all together, right? Because, you know, I mean, in our family, we have a lot of 
we have a lot of broken families where it's like step parents or, you know, parents are dating somebody else or, you know, those kinds of situations. So the just so, you know, we're not talking about just like it has to be a perfect, you know, two parents have all the same kids and, you know, there's nobody else in the house. The family is all inclusive to that kind of um, uh, marriage situation. Yeah. Marriage is basically the glue or the foundation for the family. You cannot build a house without a foundation. Um, because if you build it without a foundation, it's going to come down you know, to the ground. Yeah. In fact, it's not going to start going up because there's nothing to hold it together. So marriage is that foundation uh, in which the family could stand. And family could be just like you said, adopt the ch uh, children. It could be a niece, nephew, um, and, of course, biological kids. However, you know, this day and age with the freedom movement, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, free, freedom, uh, you know, and, and rights, you know, for everybody, uh, individual rights, a lot of the family value has dwindled away. Yeah, because everyone feels like they can do whatever they want. Exactly. So, like, you get in a relationship and then you just don't feel like being with the person anymore, whether you have kids or not. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, I'll just go do my own thing. Exactly. So that freedom, you know, as a man, uh, I have my freedom. I need my space. I need my freedom. And But yet mommy is taking care of the kids, taking the kids to baseball, to soccer, to football practice, and I'm just partying with my friends. That's what I used to do. Um, but because I needed my space, I never took in consideration the space that the space that she needed and the time that she needed for herself. Uh, so, you know, even though if the woman is a stay-at-home mom, she worked just as hard as the man that you know leaves the house at five in the morning yeah. and come back at eight o'clock at night because she's taking care of the home. Yeah. So if she's taking care of the kids, it's a burden I don't have to deal with tomorrow when my when I'm getting called at work that my son is not uh, doing well in school, that he's he got cut uh, vandalizing the hallways in the school. And that or, was me. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, that was not me. Or, you know, uh, doing drugs. Uh, now, because you know, my wife used to work in a salon and I used to work far away from home, uh, you guys spend a lot of times by yourselves. However, we had a thing in our family, and that was an agreement that my wife and I had made that Sundays was family time. That's why we went to see Spirit about 20 times. You know, but, you know, you love that movie. I do remember, I think, as a kid, you don't really, me and Alexa never really internalized it until we got older, but going... And seeing those movies every weekend, no matter what was going on, no matter what problems we had throughout the week, no matter what argument was going on, or if something bad happened, if bad grades came in, if some accident happened, whatever was this what whatever the situation was, we always had the time to watch a movie, and I think those moments are the things because that's the stuff we always remember. We always remember the movies that we watched together and what we loved about the movie, and just kind of made a point to always do that together. So I think as a kid, it gives you that family feeling, it gives you that safety that you were talking about before, kind of that consistency in the household. And I think that's that's the issue a lot, a, a lot of times with families as well, is that there's no consistent, it doesn't necessarily, I guess it is a tradition in a way, but something for everybody to look forward to, everybody to kind of prioritize because when we made plans, it was, like, around the movies. Like, when Alexa had her boyfriend or if I had some activity with a friend or if we had family over, we were always like, okay, but we're still going to watch the movie. They can come, too, but we're going to watch the movie. You know, like, our, our cousins can come. If they don't want to watch the movie, they don't have to, but we are going to. You know, her boyfriend, my girlfriend can come, but if they don't want to watch the movie, we're still going to as a family. And I think it's also important to kind of establish that kind of some some sort of tradition, you know, whether it's something for dinner, something on the holidays, something on the weekends, something in the middle of the week that everybody does together. I think that was uh, like a crucial part of kind of staying together and creating that family atmosphere. And, and that was the thing, and, uh, and we could credit that to mommy because it was 
her that wanted to push that family, uh, that family time, uh, no matter what was going on, we had to have a time for the family. So we used to go to church in the morning. After that, we went to eat, and then we would go to a movie because that was, you know, she wanted that for her family. And uh, even though I, I didn't grow up with a family, I, you know, I went from house to house to house, uh, but I had wonderful role models. Uh, they were not perfect, but they were wonderful in my, in my you know, in my eyes because, um, I don't know, I learned to to take the goods from people, to always see the good side of people, and not, um, not avoid the bad, but be aware of it and be and, and be mindful not to repeat the same uh, things that they did. Although I did repeat some of them in my youth. We well, you gotta find stuff out for yourself. <laughs> yeah, so you, you had to figure out yeah. your, uh, uh, you know, how to ride a bike uh, you know, as you go. You will never know if you know how to ride a bike until you don't get on it and fall a couple of times and get up and do it again. Yeah. Um, so as I saw, you know, people around me that grew up with without marriage or with or in marriage that were toxic, but they could still they keep they kept pushing forward, that also gave me uh ideas and gave me an education on how uh I could push forward and, and uh what shortcuts and avenues not to not to proceed uh it, if i wanted to preserve uh my family you know uh there's a there's a parable of two two men that uh two young young men that they were born for the same father they were they were twins and the father used to beat them up the father used to beat them up he was drunk this is a parable yes <laughs> in the bible not a Bible parable, but there's a man oh, that okay, okay. he used to beat up his two kids, <laughs> uh-huh. and they grew up. One was, you no, know, was dirtbag, always in and out of jail. The other one was a successful businessman. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think, and I um, this one. Yeah. and this, uh, um, how you call him, uh, reporter, he did an interview because he wanted to do a background of the brother who was a businessman. Oh, so he's looking into his life. And yeah, yeah. So I remember he's looking this story. into his life and he said, "Okay, but why are you so successful? What made you successful?" And he said, "My father." And so he's you know writing you know the book about this this guy, the successful businessman. And uh, he said, "Well, can I talk to your family? You know, since your father was a such a great role model, <laughs> uh, can I talk to your family so I could get the insights?" I said, "Sure. Talk to my brother. He's you know to say." A prison, uh, no San Quentin or, or the Rock in in Arc, in uh, in uh, San Francisco, you know, uh, Alcatraz, the Rock, Alcatraz, they call it, oh, yeah, 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 they call it the Rock. Uh, so I thought you're talking about doing jobs. No, no, not the Rock. He's not in jail. <laughs> but um, yeah, he's so he goes, he goes out, go to the prison, and talk to the brother and say, hey, so what made you be the person that you are? And uh, he said, my father. Uh-huh. That was so, probably confusing. So how yeah. how is this uh shift so drastic where you have one that's a successful businessman and one that's a dirt bag? And it's all for the same reason. So he goes back to the businessman and say, Well, your brother told me that he's in jail, he's a dirt bag because of your father. Uh and he told me that your father used to beat you guys up and that he was a bad father. He was never there for you yeah. guys. Uh he never provided, he beat you guys up, beat your mom up. He said, yeah, I'm the way I am because of my father, because I did not want to be like my father. I want to be as far from him as I could be. Uh, and that's why I'm like that. I forced myself to go to school. I forced myself to work the extra hour uh, to learn, uh, to get better, because I did not want to be like the man. So it kind of... Um, Goes to 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 my case, I did not want to be like my family. Uh-huh. I want to be different. Yeah, and I wanted my f- true family, the one that I was creating, the one that I was building, to be different as well. You know, now you guys didn't grow up with the with the latest Jordans. Uh, you guys didn't grow up with the you no know, uh, latest bells and whistles. You no, know, not because I couldn't give it to you, but because 
my wife and I opted not to because there are things that you have to earn. Mm. And it wasn't necessary. Exactly. So we thought that there were other things that were more important and more necessary than, than for you to have you know, the latest and greatest. Uh, I was talking to somebody about, uh, I believe it was your seventh birthday. Oh, when everybody uh, went over? No, no. Was it your seventh? No. My seventh birthday your, is when your, everybody came over. No, like. no. It was, it was your, tenth, your tenth birthday. Ninth or tenth, tenth birthday. You won a Madden. You won that football game. Madden? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you asked me for Christmas. I said, no, you got to save for, for it because I'm not paying $75 for a game. <laughs> and uh, and I remember I gave you $20 for Christmas uh-huh. uh, to start the savings. And I remember that. Where for, am I going to get the rest of the money? Uh, well, <laughs> the thing is, for your birthday, I remember you had $40, and my mom came by because she always came for your birthday. It's probably my 10th birthday. Uh, yeah, some, somewhere yeah. around there. And uh, she you know, uh, she gave you the $30 you were missing for the game, and I remember going to, to the store. I cannot mention the name, so you know. Uh, no, I mean, know. it doesn't matter. Okay. I'm not, like, um, sponsor or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it was a GameStop? Yeah, we went uh. to GameStop, and... Uh, and you saw the game. I remember you picked the game, and you counted your money. <coughs> and you say, well, the game is $60, and I have 70 I did this? And yeah, you yeah. said that. I rather, And then you looked at two other games that you wanted, and you said that. I'd rather get these two because it's two games instead of one, and I still got some, mom, some money left. Because I'm, I'm a financial genius. <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> And I said, well, you wanted Madden. I said, yeah, but if I take Madden, I'm going to have very little money left. So that kind of broke my heart. And I said, you know what? You're trying to be responsible for your money. So I said, okay, how much do you want to spend in all three games? And you told me $60. I said, okay. I said, I said give me 50 and I'll give you, and I'll buy the games. Because you were being responsible. You saved to get what you wanted. And and that is something that I learned from you, because we always learn from. Yeah, from I taught people. him how to save his money. Yeah. So, <laughs> but when it comes to marriage, it's basically the same way. Mm. It's it's communicating. You communicated that you rather have two other games that will cost you the same amount of money and save you some money than the one game that you really really wanted, but that you knew that you know two is better than one. I didn't. So, I don't remember. I didn't know this happened. I remember this. Yes. Thing. Wow, that's crazy. I, I, you know, I remember vividly. Yeah. And, and it taught me a lot. It's probably Dragon Ball. Z. You know. So, uh, when it comes to marriage, it's basically the same thing. When it comes to a family, it's basically a compromise for what's best for your family. At that moment, you thought that having two games was better for you than the one game that you really won. Uh, knowing that tomorrow you probably could get, you know, could get that game some 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 other way. Uh, so it's it's the same thing with with family. It's not getting it your way uh, when when you want it, uh, but it's taking it. It's being being flexible enough to compromise. Okay. On so, I guess going back to that marriage topic, do you have the same problems that you did twenty twenty five years ago in your relationship with mommy? Uh, <laughs> sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> My yeah. my mom I is mean, here too. We got a live th- audience. Th- there's a, there's a there's a behavior and personality that never leaves you. It's always there with you, but that's normal. And as long as you communicate, and as long as you know that that that's there, well, you you pass it. You go you no. Know, you you're, understand that it's you're able it's to normal. kind of like identify. Yes. Because somebody I heard somebody say that marriage is having the same argument over and over again. No, it's not. Well, they they were the way they said it seemed really wise. Where it was kind of like the like you, it was that aspect that you're talking about where you continue being the same person, you just grow together. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's kind of like when you identify that this person is like this. Like if if you like your pizza a certain way, and that never changes, and then you get on an argument about what you have for pizza. Now that you know that this person likes this pizza a certain way, they're gonna be able to be more ready to have the discussion. And maybe one of you will compromise or maybe the other person will compromise. And then likewise, when there's something that you identify like a mommy, how she likes she likes a certain 
a certain movie theater date, right? She likes a certain type of movie to watch. When you get into an argument about that, now you compromise since before she compromised on the pizza. But instead of it being, it because it's still an argument because you don't change that aspect, but it gets resolved a lot more efficiently because you already identified that. Is that kind of what? Well, is? it's kind of like that, but it's not arguing over and over about the same thing because then it becomes, oh, it's the same argument, like you say, over and over because then it becomes boring. And that's the problem in marriage today that people get bored because they the one that disturbs the homeostasis. Oh, well, I'm not they, married, so. They, they, <laughs> well, but that's what yeah. we're here for. We're here yeah. to educate one another and yeah. you know, learn from one another. But the thing is, if I do the same thing over and over and over, it's, that, it's like the rat race. Mm-hmm. You'll never get anywhere. So you have to try, try, you know, try something new, you know. So what's trying something new? What's something that you've tried new with mommy or something that she's tried new? That you can talk about lately, we haven't tried much new lately. Uh, as far as like you know, doing things at the house. Well, it doesn't, uh, I mean, but, it doesn't have to be like a big thing. It's like we don't plan things anymore because it's just the two of us, just the two of us. <laughs> and then, so we uh, we basically, if we want to go eat anywhere, it doesn't matter where uh, where we go. Uh, or if we just want to go out to the mall and we just go, and walk, we just go uh, and stuff like that. And then we always, you know, when we travel, we always plan to go somewhere that we both enjoy. You know, like, you know, this past uh, January, we went to Dominican Republic. Uh, so we went to the beach with a couple of friends and, and we stayed over there just enjoying ourselves. Yeah. So now uh, we enjoy our company more than we did. No, at the beginning. Yeah, I see him. Be- because at the beginning, it was, you know, we let the stress of life get to us, and we didn't give it uh, enough uh, of a chance or importance to communicate to one another uh, how my day was at work, how her day was at, at the salon. Uh, it was more, okay, well, let's watch TV, let's go to bed, and tomorrow let's do the same thing. Now, um, like when I go to the office, I come back home. She will ask me how how I was doing, or why why you why do you have to look? Something happened. So she knows uh, my when you come in with your face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she would instead of she throwing a thousand problems on me that are going on with the house. Uh, no, we have no. I don't know. Uh, Ran out of milk. Yeah, we run out of milk. There's no eggs. Uh, No, the kids call because they needed money. None of that stuff. Or they had this problem or that problem at their place. It's none of that. No. Now, those problems happen. She knows they happen. I don't know that happened. But because she saw my my facial expression, she saw I was tired, she saw I was a little stressed, she will not throw that on me. She will hold it. And then when I, once I'm ready for it, once she determined and she noticed through conversation that she could lay all that all that stuff on me, <laughs> yeah. then she you know, she tells me. <laughs> as to in the beginning, uh, you fall from a bike, she will tell me as soon as I get into the door without you know, taking into consideration how was my day or how was traffic. Yeah. You know, just to say something. So... Now, and I told this to, like, you eventually will get married one of these days. <laughs> um, so I tell you this as, as an advice, is that always communicate to one another. And whenever you come home, try to separate your your work family from your true family. Uh, make the home your your sacred place your like the place Swiss, like a switzerland right yes There's a, or is it sweden it's, it's one of them they're the the neutral country exactly so but you you make your home uh separate from what work is because if you bring work home uh you'll never be happy and you will never solve the problem of work either way so you want to separate those two things and always always have family time yeah 
you always want to have family time. Remember, you don't have to have kids to be a family. You and your wife could be a family. Uh, and and But you guys have to decide that between you two. Uh, there's not a book that will tell you the ABCs, the one, two, three of marriage. Yeah. It's like parenting. There's not a book. Oh, no, the kids don't come with a book saying, okay, this is parenting one, two, no, parenting one on one. Uh, these are the steps you take to be a parent or to be a husband. Uh, because what worked for me and, uh, and your mom might not work for you and your spouse. So you guys, as you guys know each other and get to know each other and communicate to one another, not only the goods, but also the bad. You know, like I heard, I like your longer hair. You know, so... <laughs> So now, <laughs> now you see how you're learning. You're letting your hair grow because you got that comment. Uh -huh. That's called compromise. You understand that, you no, know, the way your hair looks, some, I heard that through the grapevine, so don't, <laughs> don't quote me on that. But, but because you heard that, you made a change. You know, so same thing with marriage. You get to learn to know when... Uh, when my wife is called, you no, know, when when she's not uh, wanting to get up from the couch, that she just wanted, you know, stay there. It's like one thing that I know that every night before she go to bed, she had to take a nap in the couch. <laughs> so uh, that's something that I. So there's times that you no, know, I just sit there and just watch her sleep. And admire her, and and I give thanks to God that she's taking that little rest. Oh, so it's stuff like that. Yeah, it's just like she loved me. <laughs> See, okay, yeah, I guess there's um, you made a good point there about there not being like uh, end all be all or some sort of magical guidebook to your relationships, but I think having this kind of conversation helps develop that and helps kind of you have that, like you said, a role model where you take the best parts and maybe try to avoid the things that they didn't do right. What has been, I guess, the biggest challenge after being together for so long? Like, how do you, you said that you have kind of different problems now than before, but what, what, do, you, what do you think is something that is different in a bigger scale than when you guys had first been married and first started going through this process? The thing with marriage is that marriage could become monotony. Uh, a monotony. Is it monotony? Monotony? A monopoly? No, monotony. M monotony. Yeah, that thing. It could become monotonous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, 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 it can become stale where everything is always the same. Well, yeah. You know, there's people and that have been married for 30 years that barely even talk or know each other. And, and they don't like each other. They just, oh, no. my mom mentioned getting more mature too. Yeah, so it, it, it's like you don't want your relationship to become that because anytime you get into that environment of you no know, uh, doing the rat race, like I said, you no know, going a hundred miles per hour nowhere, um, you always want to try new things, but it's not just try new things the ones that I like or the ones that are going to involve you know, more people. Like, okay, let's go to this party or let's go to that party or let's, you know, or let's join this club. Because there will become a point where you're not going to be able to go to that party or that club. Yeah. So you have to make up, you know, come up with ideas that involve just the two of you. Uh, why? Because even if somebody else joins, like other couples, like when we go sometime in the summer, we go out as a family, and all the families join us. That's fine and dandy, but the plan is always between me and her. Yeah. It's what we want to do. This is what we're doing. If you want to join, you're welcome. But this is what we're doing. Yeah. You know, so don't don't join my, my you know, I don't care whether you go or not. No, we are going. So this is for us. And we always try to find times uh, just to for ourselves. Mm. Do you ever do you ever find yourself because uh, it's important? You made it obvious that it's important to stay together and to make decisions together and to do things together like in that way. But do you ever find yourself needing space from each other or kind of 
taking time away from each other at the beginning for any reason at the beginning it was like that a lot but that was because uh we didn't communicate we just talked past one another and 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 now it's like because we come from a culture that if I tell my wife everything I'm doing uh I'm 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 not a man but I always said that it takes a man to to make a woman happy uh, so there's no men that gonna make two women happy. Oh, okay, I see so, what you're saying. Um, so I say, you know, I'm gonna make it a purpose that I would understand or try to understand, because you'll never, you'll never understand them. And I'll tell you that right now, you will never understand women. Yeah, they are a creature of a different nature. Yeah, but then they say you'll never understand men. Yeah, because we are different. Uh, this is a great, this is a great uh, pastor, uh, Mark Gonger. Mark Gonger, if you see his, um, and I'm doing a, a publicity, so Pastor Gonger, uh, thanks me. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he probably might not even see this. Uh, he, uh, he has a, a, a great seminar for, for couples. Uh, it's, it's called uh, um, Laugh Your Way Through Marriage. And he talks about, you know, the differences between men and women, how different, how vastly different we are. And we always try to be one in the same, but we are so different. And, and he always says that the first thing that we have to do is understand the sheer fact that we are different. She's a girl, you're a boy. You know, you think one thing at a time, one way, you know, and you have your organized way uh, about doing things, and she's thinking about thirty thousand you know things at the same time, with the same priority. While a man is always prioritizing things one at a time, but she's always you know thinking a whole bunch of ways. Yeah, that's know. always that's always kind of the the general idea. Because there are people you know, I would say, even within our own families, like me and Alexa are kind of the opposite. Where I can, me and my sister, where I can think of a bunch of million, like a million things at the same time and work that way. And then she thinks like one thing at a time. And most of the time she'll forget that. It would but, change. Yeah, but, but what Once I was going to say married, was. it will change. <laughs> for in, in, I guess, in the foundation of the way we think, the way that we have to get things done and the way that we run our relationship as siblings is I'm usually the one that can do one thing at a time and kind of focus on that one task. And then she's the one that's always running around trying to do a million things. And in that way, so it's kind of weird how we're on the external side. It looks like I'm the one that's always doing the thinking and having a million things in my head. And she's the one going kind of like one at a time, but it's really the opposite when it comes to the more important stuff or when it comes to kind of how we are just foundationally. The one thing that I understand is that for women, everything is important. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Everything is important. And as long as you know that and respect that, you'll be okay. Yeah. The thing is, don't try to. So never ask why does it matter. Yeah. So just know that if she wants to do it, it matters. <laughs> yeah. You no. Know, now, what you do is you compromise. Mm. You know, and that's done through, you know, talking to one another. Yeah. You know that's important because she wants to do it. However, you know, this is in conflict for with this thing that we're trying to do as well. So, and that, it goes like that to everything. You know, that's why I said that, you know, marriage is the foundation for family, but family is the foundation to a home. And you cannot create a home without marriage. You know, you cannot create a, 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 a home without that foundation. You know, because I, uh, the the problem I see today is that many people, um, they don't give the importance, you no, know, like the priority that marriage is. Well, I mean, having a family doesn't really matter as much as it used to. Yes. Because having and a that, family. And I think that's the problem that we have with society. Today. Yeah, it's not as, and it really isn't as valuable. Like when you mm -hmm. had a family before, you had an opportunity to create almost your own industry within mm -hmm. your family. Exactly. You know, whether it was a farm, a family business. 
Uh, exactly. If even if it's like a corporate run family business, now everybody can kind of do their own thing individually. So creating a family isn't prioritized as much because we're all running around trying to do our own thing, trying to get our own way, trying to make it without focusing on taking care of other people. Basically, I was I was looking at some da uh, different data points as to where the the value of a marriage started decaying, you know, uh, the privilege to be married or the, or, the, or, or how you say that, the rewarding of being married started, you know, changing. And in the 60s, with the so-called freedom area, uh, era. Um, the 60s? Yeah, the 60s where people started liberating the liberation area, era. Uh, well, there's a lot of drugs and a lot of partying and, oh, and people oh, and so the people women started just doing their own and, thing and women started working, you know, and, oh. and, and earning their own way, yeah. you know, around the women started moving by themselves, started being less dependent on men. Uh, so that culture started taking away from the value of a family. Yeah. We're not saying that's a bad thing. It's just, no, uh, no, it's, it's not a, a correlation. Thing. It's a, cor it's there's a, a correlation. There. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I I started noticing how it was less important for certain individuals to be, you know, on in a in a in a family of in a marriage family, where okay we move in together, uh, it's not to my convenience. You go your own way, I go my own way. Uh, so there was not that uh, incentive to fight for one another. Yeah. Um, which I'm is the, why the divorce rate is probably yeah. super high. Yeah, so I I'm the one that I don't believe that um, that a piece of paper makes a marriage. Uh, I don't believe that. It's, it's you no, know, a marriage is made you know, based on a decision that we have made. That you know, you and I agree that we're gonna be together, and that no matter what, we're gonna try to fight for what we are trying to build. And not a piece of paper or not, you know, the circumstances are going to determine our lives. We decided we're going to determine when to cut off the ties. Yeah. But, like, what holds me uh, for these 28 years to your mom is not the piece of paper that was signed. I don't even remember that date. Cause we used, <laughs> no, for real, because we used a different date. Oh. No, we used the true date that we got together. Oh, so you didn't even, so, like, re so record it or no, write it down? No, I mean, it's the, the, the one that we recorded, you know, through the, through the uh, city hall, I don't even remember that day. I know it was in April sometime. Uh, but to me, it's December 28th. Uh, and that day, we didn't sign no papers. No, we decided that we were going to start living together. Oh, that's when you moved in together? Yeah. So, oh, so, I, so did, it wasn't even like, there. Was, it was just... There's um, no ceremony, no nothing. You guys... Was, oh, no, okay. We decided that, no. And that's what day. you've been using as your exactly. anniversary. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Because that's, to me, marriage is a decision. It's my decision that I'm going to compromise my, my, um, uh, how you say that? Singlehood? You're, <laughs> I... Uh, I guess your singleness, your bachelor, yeah, your, my your bachelor years, my, my bachelorsness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna sacrifice my bachelorsness to become a husband. No, I'm gonna give half of my space, so I could take in half of your space. Uh, so that's the day that we use, but that's not the day that you know the course is that we got married. So that's why I say marriage is more than a piece of paper. And a lot of people think that, well, it's just a piece of paper. We just tear it. That's it. No, yeah. it's not. I mean, the divorce rate is like 50%, I think. I mean, At least it's, it's it was crazy. 50% there a couple of years ago. It's, I don't know what it, it is. It is crazy right now. I haven't checked in a while, cause, but it is alarmingly so high. And and it's, be, it's because of the part, partially is because of that, you know, the piece of paper meaning so much. Yeah. It's also because the piece of paper now ties in money. So... The it represents whoever, something. It represents what the man owns, what the woman owns, what whoever owns. It represents the house. It represents the assets. Mm -hmm. Represents the investments. If you guys have investments, 
And then it represents, there's also this weird kind of like, they determine how much, if you, in a in a divorce, usually the, the woman ends up getting some of the money because in, in America, for the most part, the man is a breadwinner. And they, they for how, I don't know how they calculate, but they'll be like, oh, the woman deserves this so much of money. Mm -hmm. Like in um, uh, Jeff Bezos' case, he, uh, he gave her like $5 billion. And I'm like, I I understood the logic, but it's like, how do you come up with that number? You know, they they put some things together and then they estimate the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that piece of paper has now become your worth almost in the marriage. Exactly. And that's why it's so easy partially for some people to be like, okay, we'll just, we sign the paper. All we have to do is get rid of the paper and we're not married yeah. anymore. So, but not taking into consideration the ties that we built together yeah you know that that we forge a a bond uh that is what we're supposed to be always fighting for and looking into instead of oh, it's just a piece of paper it's not the piece of paper that's going to make a family it's not the piece of paper that's going to determine um when you get old whether you're going to be with somebody or not because that piece of paper once you sign it it just stays out there it doesn't do you any good it other than what dust. you were saying uh, about investment and stuff like that. And and once you put put it in, in your license or your passport that you're married, you don't even need a piece of paper anymore. Yeah. So you hardly need it for anything else. Because uh, what you do is you... And your you taxes. Should, yeah, you taxes. You should, yeah. But you use your, 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 uh, your Social Security and, and the state ID. You your state yeah. ID will say, you know, the driver's license will say marry. So... You don't need the license anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 that's the thing that we we put so much stock into it that we cease to see what is truly value about marriage, which is the the relationship that we're forging, the the the, the foundation, and and though I keep talking about foundation because I like that word so much. Um, no, because you can't build nothing without it. So you you stop building that that one bondage with with uh, you start bonding together with one another, and you start learning to one another. One of the problems that happen is when you grow in together, is that you start liking that person so much, you start depending on the person so much that you start hating it, because now you like. Eh, I would be, now I'm gonna be nothing with that. I, I, I'm gonna no, I'm gonna be old with this person, and, and that's it. My life is gone. Uh, like you're gonna go through like the late twenties, early thirties when when you, you know when you with a person you know for five, ten, fifteen years, uh, especially between seven and and twelve years of marriage. Yeah, years, years of marriage. Together, that, yeah, yeah. That's that's the hardest part because uh, you start realizing that you know, okay, this is it. This, this is, is for real. Yeah, this is for <laughs> like, real. This is happening. You know. Yeah. Uh, the first couple of years, like, oh, we love, we dating, you know, the we're going phase. around and, uh -huh. and we go here, we go there, uh, we jump three times and nothing hurts. Yeah. But then year five comes around like, man, if this is it, year seven comes around like, is this really it? And you go through that motion because now you are adjusting your life. You're saying, okay, this is for real. It's yeah, because now you, there's things that you're depending on that other person to exactly. do. Exactly. So now you have the, created a dependency for something from that other person, but that other person is also created a dependency on, on you yeah. for something else. And, so I, that's kind of my it, point earlier. Is that isn't it important to create that space so that you can keep your individuality a little bit? Yes. And at least... so. Because a lot of times, though, they always tell you that you have to work on yourself and you have to be ready for a relationship. You have to be ready to be somebody else's partner. But in the relationship, it's also important for you to keep that individuality so that you don't end up hating each other after, when you depend on each other for everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, but you have to build that individuality into the family concept. Yeah, yeah. Because if you build that indiv individuality just by yourself, your knees, uh -huh. And you don't take into account her needs, and then when they're munchings, or, you know, their kids, they also have needs that's gonna compromise your space. Yeah. So your space has to be built around those around, spaces. You know, yeah. Uh, those spaces. So it becomes like you know where where they build that that, that the three circles that they 
touch one another. The oh, the Venn diagram. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it becomes that. Yes, you have your space. You're entitled to your own space. You're entitled, you're entitled you to your own You have to build freedom, the rest of it. Into but there. you have to take in consideration that, hey, she's giving up her space too. Yeah. That you're invading. Uh, you got a kid that didn't ask you to come that also needs space, but that also needs you. Yeah. So... Uh, you cannot be selfish and say, "Well, it's my space, and yeah. I cannot. It's my time, and I cannot compromise that." Yeah. You know, so uh, you take it as it goes. Yes, you want to plan it, you want to, you know, put it into motion, but you also have to be flexible. Yeah. And the problem with today's society is that we're not flexible enough. There's and, no compromise, and we don't. Well, there's no flexibility, so there will be no compromise, and and it's all about me. You know, it's that me, 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 yeah. me, me. And there's a, you know. a interesting point that I wanted to talk about too that you mentioned was how important like you use your moving date as your uh, anniversary, and I kind of reminded me of. And then you started talking about how important it is when you move in together and the space that you're sharing is that we also build those relationships with people that we're not married to, like mm-hmm. roommates. Mm-hmm. You know, I I hear so many stories of people that are best friends that were college roommates. Or people that in my own personal life, the guys that I used to live with when I was living uh, at my schools, I had talked to, I still talk to most of them. I built really close relationships with them. And I think the fact that you're living together in this space, not just sharing the space, but you get to know each other. You you have to get to know each other because you're, you're, that's the only way you're going to survive sharing this space together. And I think a lot of people don't take that as seriously as they should. We take it seriously with our friends, like, oh, you know, that's my best friend. Or, oh, we, we shared all those, like, we shared that year or two together, living together. But when it comes to, like, a romantic relationship, we're like, oh, we're just moving together. So we'll just, we're just moving together, we're going to figure it out. Or they meet somebody and they move in together shortly after dating them. And they don't take that space to kind of do the same preparation that you would with somebody that's just a friend or somebody that might be a stranger that becomes your roommate. We do so much preparation for that. But a lot of times I see that people move in together way too fast or they move in together not setting a foundation. Because when it's a friend, when it's a friend, it's just, okay. this is kind of like how I am. This is how I want my space, blah, blah, blah. But when you're dating someone, you don't want to you don't want to like scare them away or you don't want to offend them. Or maybe you don't take it that seriously, so you're like, oh, they'll just compromise for me, and that isn't communicated like we usually do. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's I didn't I never had the privilege uh, to to go to college and, and be in a dorm room. Uh, I did my schooling, I did my my bachelor's and my master's online, basically after I was done with the military while I was working. Yeah, but see, uh, in the military, you I, yeah, it's a little different because it was but that's it was a little more packed. At. But yeah, that's what I'm getting at. I had the privilege to have roommates uh, in the barracks the few years that I that I stayed in, in on base, and uh, and you know one of my best friends. I mean, he God bless his soul. He passed away this early. Uh, late last year, uh, Rico um, Sanchez and I we basically grew up to be like brothers. Um, but you know he outranked me, and when we moved in, uh, when I was moved into his room, I got to Korea first, and then uh, we were in the same platoon. Uh, but then uh, they moved us together in the same room, and right away we put you know he. You no, know, he being the the higher rank, he put his his his, uh, boundaries. his his boundaries, and because he's the higher rank, I have to obey by it. But we never had any problems because he knew uh, my boundaries and I knew his boundaries, and we yeah. respected each other. But it was like whatever I wanted from him, I take it. But I there was stuff that I knew I cannot cross. Yeah. Because those were the boundaries. So same thing with marriage. Um, you get into a relationship, the first thing you got to do in marriage, there's no boundary, first of all. But there are lines that you're supposed to respect. Well, there's a boundary, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, you could say that. Um, yeah. So, but you work around those. Yeah. And as you grow older, it becomes more... Um, uh, of a guideline that you really don't follow, but you know is there. You it's know a little, so it's, it's less strict. Yeah. Little, yeah. So uh, they get loosened, and 
at times you actually develop those boundaries to be part of yours. No, so because you say, okay, this person don't like, um, like my wife don't like me to go, like when I used to play softball. Yeah, how did you adjust? You didn't talk about how you adjusted to mommy when you guys started um, kind of getting more comfortable. Okay, like when, when, when I used to play softball, you know, sweat stinks. <laughs> and then I have beer on top of it, or rum, you know, all drunk and stuff like that. So one of the things that she always says is like, Take off those clothes and take it out of the bag and don't put it with the with the dirty laundry. You have to take those clothes straight to the laundry and keep them there. Uh, oh, I remember with that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I always wonder why you just threw your clothes so separately. I always had that, you know, because that's a boundary that she set. So those clothes will be washed, you know, separate from the other clothes. Um, there were things that, you know, I didn't like that she used to do. Uh, like she was always independent. She was very, very, very independent. <laughs> and you were so you were the clingy one. No, she yeah. was she was the clingy one. I no, she was, but she was always strict and very independent. She said, "Okay, I want to hand that picture there. Uh, can you nail it?" And I said, "Okay, I'm doing a little bit." Next thing you know, she's nailing it. Oh, and that I used to piss me off. For you, yeah. No, she would tell me, and then five minutes later, she's boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and so. <laughs> Uh, it bothered me, but at the same time, I'm like, well, why, did you, why didn't you get up? No, go ahead and did it. And I'm still struggling with that. I know you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm still struggling with that, but now what she does is, like, she want to do something. She'll call me and tell me, she, you know, if I could give it a minute. So the flexion of the voice I, tells me whether it's, like, yesterday, today, or today. Something that could be done next week. Uh -huh. But I learned that through time and talking to her and getting to know her priorities and, and the way that she thinks. Yeah. You know. So how did I adjust to her? I tell you, I think it, it, I cannot tell you there was a specific point where uh, what he changed because even after I became a Christian, by then I was already changing. It was... Uh, we had some issues because of my drinking, and uh, and and it was not so much of an issue uh, because she said that I was um, basically violating the the boundaries that we had together. You know, it came to a point where our Sundays were no more. Oh, okay. Our family time was taken away for from you no know, from the family from her. Uh, because of my drinking, because it became all about me, and not about us, the home, yeah. not about us. So in my mind, I'm sorry, I'm fine because I'm drinking at home. I'm not going out. I'm not dating <laughs> anybody. Yeah. I'm just getting pissed drunk in my house in my basement. You know, and I'm listening to music over here and just getting pissed drunk. And sometimes I used to fall asleep down there, but. I did not understand that I was robbing the family from the dad. I was taking that away from the family, so now it's no longer a family. It's not a whole family. It's something missing. And once I became a Christian, I was still not drink without the drinking and stuff like that, but I was still being absent from... Uh, from the family yeah you know, in what way well in, in a way where okay we go to church we go eat but there's no i didn't pay much attention to to you guys to well, your the needs thing, and, and 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 to what you guys wanted to do well the you thing know. is with uh from what i've gathered research and just hearing people talk about their experiences is that when you lose an addiction or where you kind of, um, when you get out of a routinely thing that you always do, you always try to find the next thing to do that with. Yeah. So if you... To get addicted to. Yeah. So, if, for example, if you eat a lot and then you want to change that, you start working out a lot. So now, like I've seen people where they used to be super big, they used to be super um, overweight, 
But now that they're not eating, they're going to the gym. And maybe they're going to the gym a little too much. So now it's still taking the same time away from their family mm-hmm. and their friends, but it's doing something different. Well, he, here's the thing. With the same effect almost. Here's the thing. For me, I replace alcohol with church. Uh, not Christianism. Church. Church. The religion, yeah. I replace drinking a bad habit with another bad habit. Yeah. Because now I'm devoted to the church. Yeah, I remember I I'm I got mad at you to, for that. Uh, yeah. Everything is all around the church, and everything is around the church. It's yeah. around religion. It was not about being Christian. It was not about being a you know Christianism. It was about religion, because that's what it was. So, at the same time, I'm neglecting my family. Mm. Yeah, because I I mean I didn't. At least when I was at that age, I didn't see it that way, but I, I still saw kind of the same situation where you and mommy were all caught up in doing all these activities with the church. And for me, I was the way I saw it was that you guys were always tired and always always kind of like dead and you guys never had any any time for anything else. And and I was like, you guys got to like relax with the responsibility. You got to you're basically almost running everything well, you got your you at least you have your hand in every in all the pots and f- as, i guess there was a little bit of me that that was a little that wanted some of that attention but at the same time my biggest at least the way that i had it in my mind was i wanted you guys to relax like i wanted you to take a break cuz i and at that point you know i was i think i was like 15 or 16 I was doing my own thing. I was I had my sports in my school, my friends. So it wasn't so much of the attention that I was looking for, but it was annoying that when there was those times where I wanted that attention, you guys were doing the church stuff. And it was because it was so much of your life at that point. Well, and it was not so much of a, a, a bad thing. It just became I'm replacing one addition by another so I'm repl- I'm trying to fill a void, and and for the you guys watching and listening to this, uh, it's okay to fill a a a, a void that, that something else have left, but if you if you had a problem, if you had an addiction like I was, I was an alcoholic, and I'm I'm not afraid of saying it, um, because I used to abuse alcohol, and I took the void from from drinking. And I tried to fill it with Christ, with Jesus. However, instead of filling it with Jesus, I felt that hole, uh, that hole was filled with religion, which is two different things. So because religion will take you away from family. Religion will take you away from things. But Christ will take you into the family and be more accountable to your family and to the loved ones and those who's around you. And it will give you space and time to deal with the people, but also keeping in, in mind what's really important. It's more of a spirituality than a Exactly. Yeah. So um, I took to church as my my bar, you know, my basement. And and I took to... That's a good way to put it, yeah. ...to worshiping as my alcohol. So I want to be in a I church think environment. I, now, when you say it that way, I think there's a lot of people that yes. are kind of like that. Yes. That even if they're not doing it on purpose, that it really is kind of that it, for them. Yeah, too. It, it's, it's you trying to avoid going back to where you came from, um, but not knowing that you're going into a similar hole. Not the same hole, but a similar one. Uh, I don't know if it's specifically Christianity, but spiritual or religious conver- conversion is the the biggest oh i don't want to say antidote but like it kind of is the the most prominent cure for alcohol alcoholism mm-hmm. there's a i don't know the specific number but i think that the biggest cure for like those aa meetings mm-hmm. are structured around you know there's the 12 step process yep. it's all about spirituality and filling that mm-hmm. void of drinking with that yeah. spirituality and i th- i think that there's um there's kind of it's not a bad thing, but there has to be a conversation and there has to be attention put on people that kind of just go and get addicted to it mm-hmm. instead of using it to to get away from that bad habit. Yeah, I, I think it was I, probably, like, I could have articulated that a little better, but I you know I got my my point. Yeah, I think it was uh, Charles Spurgeon that said one time. I like history books. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a an old English pastor. And uh, he said in one of his books, I think it is, 
that you cannot say no to something without having something else to occupy that void. So you can't, is it, I feel, you can't say no to something without saying yes to something else. Exactly. I think, is that? Yeah. Yeah, is that, okay. Uh, because he said, as long as you have the void there, there will always be a flower vase missing from the uh, coffee table. They always That's be. That's an old person thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, this, yeah. There's always going to be a lamp missing from from your uh, uh, corner table, you know, right next yeah. to the couch. Um, but basically, it is what he his point was. There's something missing, and that's gonna bother you until you put something there. Okay. Yeah. So I tell people, I said, you know, I don't tell people become a Christian. I tell people become a follower, a disciple of Jesus, because Jesus didn't build Christians; he built disciples. Uh, and when you talk about marriage, you have to build a relationship. The end goal is to build a home, not to build a house. Anybody could build a house. A single person could build a house. But it takes a marriage to build a home. So when 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 you go, uh, when you embark on that journey, you know, it's like a baseball team. Somebody have to bunch you over. Somebody have to get on base, but somebody have to bunch you over for somebody else to have the opportunity to drive to you home. To home. Yeah. So there had to be the teamwork in order for you to um, uh, to win the game. And you know I'm, I was going to bring it back to baseball, so, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, I, can't, uh, I cannot have a conversation without a baseball reference on it. That's just me. So marriage is basically a compromise um, and a decision. It's a personal decision that you do, that you make, that you take, knowing and willingly to fight and to overcome any obstacle that comes before you. So a relationship is is the waiting room to a family, to a uh, to a marriage, excuse me. Uh once once you're dating somebody, it should be somebody uh, that's basically in the waiting room and re- getting ready to enter uh, to be part of something greater. You know, marriage is what you want it to be. It's not what society wants it to be. You are the one that decides what, you know, what is marriage? How does my family look like? What am I going to have as a family? You know, I see a lot of people getting married today. They they know each other, and tomorrow they get married, and that's it. But they never – I remember, like, the Catholic Church uh, – oh, I shouldn't say that. Why? Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the Catholic <laughs> – You're not uh, naming no, names. The, the, the Catholic Church used to have this program where before you could get married, you had to go to through a counseling section. Um, today you see people that um, – well, that's they actually that's that sounds like what you should do. Yes. Yeah. And that's why marriage used to last so long, because before they got married, they used to go to counseling section. Yeah. I have made it my point as a pastor, as a minister, a day minister, and with the legal right to get people to to issue to sign marriage. Where did license. that come with being becoming a chaplain, or is that a different uh, thing? They not so much with the chaplain, but uh, when I was ordained, I was also registered in the state. Oh, okay, as, okay. You no, know, to be. An official of the state, no. I think I got license. Yeah, I got license in New York, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I think, yeah. No, I think the one from from Pennsylvania is good for all states. And then I got separate for New York, New Jersey. But the thing is, um, like I have made it my point that before I, I issue a vow or I grant a vow of marriage to somebody or I'll be witness to a marriage. Um, I want to sit with those people for at least two or three times just to make them aware of what are they embarking. That it's not just, okay, we're just going to sign this piece of paper and now you carry my name and we do the taxes, we do, you know, I'm going to claim this. No. So 
it's not that. I feel like you should, because the thing is, most of us, just as people in general, would benefit from some sort of therapy or counseling, because, you know, the world is pretty messed up, and a lot of some most a lot of people more than others go through really traumatic things that and they never get the the help that they need to work through it so mm -hmm. going into a relationship it definitely isn't gonna end up pretty for them so i think it, it it makes sense for you before you decide to give this other person give into this other person's life and they decide to give into your life it's it's should it should be a topic of conversation at least where mm -hmm. you're you're deciding to go through some counseling sessions, get some therapy, work out what what needs to get worked out that you don't know is there, and then together that'll probably help you start the relationship off a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. And and the first thing when you even thinking about embarking in a journey like that is to understand and recognize who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, guess what? The other once you get married. It's going to get even worse because you're going to be even more confused. Yeah, and that other person's not going to know who you no, are. No, and they're not going to be able to help you. But if you know who you are, you could tell that person, hey, I'm X, Y, Z. Yeah. And that other person, if she's willing to embark in that journey, will understand that you're X, Y, Z, and she's going to try to help you with your with your uh, shortcomings. Yeah, and then she'll be like, hey, I'm X, Y, Z. Yeah, and, and then she'll be more yeah. free to say, hey, if you're X, Y, Z, I'm ABC, <laughs> so you know, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I have problems too. Yeah, yeah, you know. So and these are my problems, and that makes it a stronger relationship. That way, in when you're married seven years into the marriage, and she start acting B, you be able to recognize it because she already told you from the beginning. Yeah. You know, but the problem is, I find out in year seven, year five, that you're B. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm B, X, and B is 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 you know uh, overshadowing my X, and it's you know aggravating my Y. Yeah. So <laughs> now we're gonna have some issues, yeah. and in year seven we're still going the same way. So it's in year twelve where we say, you know what, you have poked me so much into my Y that I don't really really care anymore. But you're still living with that in you, your heart, you just and care, then you see yeah, people. On the inside. You see people being together, being in a marriage together for 20 years and go, getting a divorce because they did not address the ABCs and the XYZs And I also see time. The, the other thing, at least culturally, because, you know, I don't have much experience with marriages besides American and Latino. The when the kids leave is a lot of times when divorces come out too. Yes. Because the marriage will either stay together because the kids are distracting from the problem or because they decide to stay together because of the kids. Yes. So now that there's an empty house and they're forced to kind of deal with each other, then they're like, oh, no, this is not cool. Like, I, I don't want to. This hasn't been going on for 20 years. And now mm -hmm. that all the kids are, are here, I'm finally noticing it. Or now you're kind of acting a little differently that I didn't see before. Or they didn't see something that I was doing before, and then the divorce because it kind of it's kind of like opening up uh, a whole bottle instead of just pouring a little sip. Yeah. I, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. It's like overflowing everything that should have been worked out the years prior into one because, year, basically. Because you stop putting things away and postponing it, and don't address it. And all of a sudden, if you start stuffing stuff in a closet, no matter how big that closet gets in 20 years, if you're stuffing stuff in there, it's going to fill it's up gonna eventually. Up eventually and it's going to burst. And then that's going to be a problem. So once the thing that we don't understand is that life has stages. You got your, your bachelor stages. You got your young marriage, you know, beginning marriage stages, uh, the family stages where kids start popping and, and I'm buying a house, uh, you know, I'm moving up in the world, I'm growing, and we are growing together. Um, there are issues that arise from time to time or that I didn't know, I wasn't aware that I had that problem. And at the stage where I have kids, my wife started pointing out those problems that, you no, know, I really don't listen when she talks to me and 
I'm more focused on making money because I have two kids now running around and you know she just yapping because you know what she got a beautiful house she got a car she got this I buy her jewelry I buy this and she's comfortable but I'm not paying attention to her needs I'm not paying attention uh, to what she really wants to do uh, for her and for her family because I'm focused that I make good money and I'm providing you a great life yeah. that I, I start situ- neglecting yeah, the person a lot. and that happens a lot so now you're gone kids are gone it's just me and this person that I neglected for so long that I thought that by giving her you know the car that she wanted the jewelry that she wanted the purse that she wanted the shoes that she wanted when at the end of the day that's not what she really wanted she wanted my attention. She wanted to talk to me and for me to listen to her. And now that uh, my Josefina and I were going through this, is is I have realized that you know she's my best friend. She's been my only friend. It's the person that I have shared with the most in my life. The real MVP. So I I have shared more with her than with anybody else in my life. I have been longer with her than with anybody else in my life, uh, including well, my I mom. Mean, I mean, now you've been, you guys have been together longer. You guys have been together longer than you have been without each other. Yeah. So the thing is, now we have to change because our stages is changing. You know, we went from a big house to an apartment. It's like you said when we're moving. You say you go from a big old house to a to a little box. How you expect that everything's gonna fit? Well, now it's <laughs> now it's there. <laughs> now it's there. You guys try to fit a whole house in there. Yeah. So the thing is, you know, we changing stage. So we have to make adjustment too, because each stage demands an adjustment. So now we're making this judgment because we're trying to do something else. We have other plans that we're trying to accomplish. And as we go through this stage, we learn more about each other. And I have to make it a point that I have to understand that she's going through some physical changes and she has some physical needs that I need to provide space, time, and care for. And when I said time is to let her let her be, give her uh, her own space. Yeah. So when I said care, is pay attention to, you know, what can I do to alleviate what she's going through, to help her get through what she's going through, and, you know, and be mindful that she's changing, and that she's no longer, you know, twenty, twenty five, thirty. You know, it's not that she's old people, but um, you guys are getting old. The thing is, the thing is, our body changes. Yeah, yeah. And as we change, as we go older, our knee changes. And we have to be mindful of that. Uh, and that's all done through communication. It's me trying to understand her, but it's also her making it a point to understand me. Uh, and it goes both ways. That's why I told you, marriage is a two-way street. It's like conversation. You know, you go and she comes, and we have to be. You know, if you if you go, uh, you no know, cross over to her boundary, guess what? It's gonna be a head-on collision, and it's gonna be a disaster. But if you stay in your lane and she stay on her lane, and I'm not talking about people, of, you know, just everybody on the, doing their own thing. No, it's working as a team. Uh, in a harmony to where uh, we move in our lane, but we move together in the same direction. Yeah. You know, for the same purpose. Well oiled machine. Yes. And that's done when you communicate, when you talk. Well, that was good stuff. I think that's a good point to end it. Yes. We've been talking for like almost an hour and a half, I think, now. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked mostly about marriage, and we, we have some family stuff in there, but I think the the main focus here was to do that introspection, to have that reflection, not only within yourself, but within the, the person that you're choosing to be with, 
and that applies to your all of your relationships is figuring out who you are where you stand and in relation to that other person where they are where they stand and the boundaries that you set with each other so pastor sandy paulino papi thank you for for joining us on the sandbar today hope to have you in the future we're probably going to talk about baseball sometime but um you know thank you if you have anything else if you want to Say well, anything else to whoever's listening out there? Now's your time. Well, I could tell you if you are in a in a relationship, if you are um, thinking about taking the next step, uh, like they say, jumping the broom. Uh, know this: if you if you establish a good line of communication, clear line of communication, you're bound to be successful no matter what you do. Same thing goes to marriage. If you no, set clear lines of communication and you learn to talk to one another, to listen to one another, um, both physically and, um, and, and, and through voice. Verbally. Verbally. Uh, you're going to have a wonderful marriage. Uh, I'll give you this advice that I was, it was given to me about, I'll say about 20, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, maybe less, about 18, 20 years ago, um, this old wise man told me that when there was a disagreement between me and my wife, there should only be one other witness, and that was the bed. That if we had any any disagreement or any differences, that we were to discuss everything in the bed, in our uh, marital bed, in our bedroom in on our bed uh, meaning that everything that happens and that we disagreed upon was to be shared you know before we go to sleep mm. that was like in the, our bed so the, that was like the conference room for you guys. yes yeah and that we were to put everything to bed at that point so Don't play on words yeah. so it's basically uh, whatever disagreement you have, you have it in your bed and you put it to bed. Meaning that tomorrow when we get up, no, that monkey is our is off your back and it's also off her back and we don't we don't bring it back. We just keep moving forward, understanding that you no, know, we either came to an agreement or we agreed to disagree, uh, but we will not let that affect our family and our you no know, end goals. So I'll end with that. Um, there's always space uh, to come to an agreement. Uh, there's always uh, a way uh, to make a good thing continue to work. Because if you decided to join that person and spend your life with that person, share your life with that person, it's because you thought that you could grow old with that person. Let's get back to that. Let's get back to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me in your Thank program. You. Uh, once again, now speaking as a father, I tell you I'm very, very proud of you. You have done wonderful. And and I just going to urge you to keep going forward. Keep reaching for those dreams that you are looking for, you know, that you, that you have. And never give up. Never give up. Just keep on going. Doing great things. Love and you, Poppy. <laughs> Thank you. I love you, too. And thank you for watching The Sandbar. Tune in for our next episode. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. Put them in the comments. Shoot me a DM, whatever it is. Thank you for watching. Very grateful for everyone out there listening to The Sandbar. And we will see you next time.